All right, good morning. So I'm excited uh, that we are starting to fill up this side of the church. If you didn't notice, we were kind of tilting a little bit there. Everybody was on one side. But Good morning. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, standing in this morning for Matt. Just a couple of quick announcements before Dave gets started. Um, we are having the men, annual men's breakfast next month, so the third. So please be ready for that. I don't know exactly what that's going to look like, but... Uh, Put it on your calendars for the first, uh, for the third, sorry, of December, the first Saturday in December. Um, and the other thing is that if you can help um, Terry Drinkwater move today, I think Ron Pirtle, uh, from what I got from Matt, is is kind of heading it up. Um, <clears throat> as today, this morning, as soon as we're done here, if anybody has a little bit of uh, time that they can devote to that, appreciate it. I've got an address I can put out um, and give uh, for that. So. That's it. Um, otherwise, I'm going to introduce Dave. He's coming up uh, to teach today. He, I think this is your first time teaching, right? So, um, you know, appreciate the, all the leaders that have stepped up. Appreciate Dave stepping up today and, and bringing us some of Book of Acts. So, with that, Dave. take this off. I don't want to intimidate anybody with greatness. Uh, for you Commanders fans that are out there struggling a little bit. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's a good time to be a Philadelphia fan. We've got a, what's that, game six tonight uh, for the Phillies. The Eagles are 8-0. The Philadelphia Union's got their game this afternoon. Their finals. So, yeah, interestingly, my um, a good friend of mine that I, I grew up with playing soccer. Um, I went to the Marine Corps. He went to college. He's the coach of the Philadelphia Union. So, um, yeah, you wonder if he made different decisions in life. What do you do? But interesting. So I wish them good luck too. <laughs> well, good morning again. I, I appreciate the opportunity to come up here and speak in front of you all. Um, we'll go through Acts, follow up what Pat went over. Um, the last time we were here. So we'll kind of do a little bit of a review and go through what Pat covered, and then we'll, we'll lead into, into Acts chapter 2. Um, one thing I wanted to try and do is this morning is highlight, um, do an example of, of one thing we'll see in, in Acts 2, um, and that's failure. We'll, we'll see some failure um, from one person in particular as we, as we go through that story. So I figured what I'd do is just kind of share a recent failing that I had, um, and we'll, we'll try and tie that in at the end here. Um, you know, failure is something that we all, are, I think, have a, a good fear of. Um, you know, but it's one thing that we all have in common. Everybody fails. Um, you know, there's probably one person that walked the earth that did not. Um, but if you look at all of us, that's one thing that, whether we have a failure of, uh, a fear of failing ourselves or failing somebody else, um, you know, that's, I think that's something that we all kind of wake up with every day and hope that, that we don't do. Um, so recently, um, I retired a few, few weeks ago out of the Marine Corps, um, but for 25 plus years, I was an instructor, uh, subject matter expert. I taught at schoolhouses my entire career from entry level training through sniper school, through advanced courses. I could tell anybody anything about a weapon system in the Marine Corps, whether it's how to set headspace and timing on a 50 cal, how to employ mortar systems, applied ballistic theory, you name it, um, you know, young Marines, officers, enlisted would, would seek me out to answer their questions, um, very technical questions, and almost always I was able to come up with the answer. Um, it was a good feeling to have. But then, you know, now that I'm making my transition, um, we host a life group, um, and I realize that this is an area I'm not a subject matter expert in. Um, you know, one question came up, I, I prepared for four or five hours, get my notes together, I was going to crush it, um, you know, one question, and I was like, I don't know, in my four to five hours of preparation, I did not think to, to dive into that subject. Then another question, then another question, to me, I felt like I was, I was failing. Um, others probably maybe didn't pick up on it, but for me, I felt like 
I was letting down the group, I didn't prepare enough, you know, what should I do next time? Um, but what that caused me to do is the next time we got together, I was able to dive deeper into those questions and, and answer them there. Um, slightly frustrating though, when you know you see Pastor Mark and Pastor Matt up here and they're able to go through their studies, and you're like, man, they, how do they know all this? Um, and then in a small life group, you know, you're, you're, you're coming up short with answers when, when folks are looking at you to do that. And I realized, you know, that it's not about having the answers. It's about being able to lead the group through those questions um, and as a group find out the answers. And I think that's a lot of what we do here when we, we meet on Sundays is, um, and then you, especially the men's groups, like this is a good, I don't know what the right term is, safe space, uh, if I'm not being too... Uh, political, but, you know, this is a good area where we can come and we can ask the hard questions and we can dive deeper into things in the small groups because it's definitely not about the person standing up here. It's, a, you know, when we're done and we transition to the small groups where we really need to dive in and ask the hard questions of each other. And then as a group, try and figure out what the answers are, um, you know, for the younger guys that get up early on Saturday mornings. I commend the younger fellows that come here pretty often on a regular basis. Um, you know, I, in ways I think they're a lot further along than a lot of us were. Um, I think it's gonna make them better young men, better fathers, better husbands, um, because they're here. You know, how many of their peers are still asleep or have about four or five more hours worth of sleep left? But, you know, they get up, they get up early. Um, I was surprised the first time I came to one of the men's studies and saw how many of the teenagers, the teenage boys came out to those events. Um, it's great to see, uh, you know, I, I wish, I had done that at their age. It's really setting them up for success later on in life. But for us, as the men in the church and in our homes, I really think that these small groups are, are pretty important. Um, what I would do is challenge the younger guys to ask questions. Usually they kind of sit there a little bit quiet in the groups, which, which is fine, but I would challenge them to, to ask harder questions of us or why do we think that's you know, something that, that we agree with or don't agree with. And then for us, we really need to, to push each other um, not to be afraid to fail in the small groups. Um, you know, when we leave here, we should feel better off about ourselves that we're contributing to our growth and, and trying to extend our capacity for what we understand within, within the book. So, again, I think as we see, we'll see um, as we get into Acts chapter 2, uh, we'll highlight um, some of the failures that, that folks might have experienced or shown and Hopefully at the end of it, when we, we can talk about it in the small groups and we, when we break out and those guys that are, you know, a little bit more seasoned in the word, hopefully you can help to continue to drive our discussions in the small groups. Um, so yeah, if what we'll do real quick is I'll, I'll, I'd like to go over a little bit of what, um, what Pat went over, but real quick, if, uh, if we could just bow our heads and we'll pray before we, we get into the word. Dear Lord, we thank you for bringing us together. We thank you for your servant Luke, who was intentional about gathering the story, uh, the information that he's gonna provide for us about the first, first church community. We thank you that we might learn about this story and learn about the origins of how your church are formed and how your Holy Spirit was at work and moving in the community at that time. Help us today, help us be changed today, help us understand your Holy Spirit a bit better Help us be more connected to your Holy Spirit as we read and reflect today. Lord, we pray that you continue to make us better men, fathers, husbands, leaders, both at home and in the workplace, at school, in our communities. Please continue to watch over us as we can, and continue to bless us and our families. Lord, we ask that you please continue to keep us and our families all happy, healthy, and safe. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so the first two chapters of the book of Acts, uh, Luke gives us an account of Christ's ascension and then the Holy Spirit coming down, which we're going to dive into today. In chapter 1, we see Jesus' instructions and promises to the apostles, and as Pat called it, what is next? I think that was a, a good term to, to kind of place on chapter 1. Uh, as we saw, the apostles kind of standing by and, and, you know, and looking up as Jesus ascended to heaven to try and figure out what they were supposed to, to do next, and they got a a little nudge from a couple angels that was like, fellas, we've already, you're already told what to do. Just have faith and, and carry out, carry out the plan of the day. Um, 
you know, they were supposed to go out and make disciples. Uh, we went over how Acts is essential in understanding the New Testament, specifically the epistles. Pat highlighted that Acts was the book of first, the first churches, the first deacons, elders, missions, the first time we see the Holy Spirit dwell in believers. Acts details the history of the first 30 years of the Christian church. church. Acts is also a, a continuation of Jesus' work through the Holy Spirit using the first Christian saints. Today, what I'm, I'm calling chapter two is the church chapter. This is gonna help set up the foundations and the way forward that we would see churches uh, kind of evolve over time and what we, what we see today. And it's an opportunity for some information for us to be able to go back and, and help us through the blueprints of, of Acts figure out where and why churches are established the way they are. And I think Pastor Mark kind of highlighted that on Sunday with how he refers back to certain chapters and, uh, and books within the Bible is how he structures just our services with how we come in, we gather, we fellowship, we pray, we get into the word. Um, and he was pretty intentional about why we do certain things that we do uh, on Sundays and Wednesday nights. So again, this is going to be the church or origin story uh, and really its purpose story. As we go through this chap chapter this morning, I'd like you to listen for, for three things and just kind of keep them in the back of your mind as, as I read through the fairly lengthy chapter. But um, what we'll do with those three topics is we're going to use those to guide our discussions in the small groups. So the first one, listen to what the Holy Spirit is doing. The Holy Spirit is essential in the life of the church. We really see the Holy Spirit at work and moving to really push the community in this chapter. And I think we'll highlight some of those reasons as, as we read through. Number two, in this chapter, Peter's going to give a sermon where he explains what is really happening and try and answer some of the questions that those that were observing what was going on uh, help them understand why things are occurring the way that they are. As we read through this, please listen and notice that the information is essential to him and he's explaining the good news about Jesus. And number three, as we get to the end of the chapter, as we get a quick look into the practices of the early church, try and remember and notice what those practices are all. Um, there'll be some highlights as far as what the, what the people were doing, what they were asking, how the other apostles were helping to kind of guide uh, the discussions that were occurring and explaining what everybody was seeing. I think that's a pretty important area to highlight as we, as we kind of carve through this, this chapter. All right, so if we would, we'll open to Acts chapter 2. And when the day of Pentecost, uh, again, Pentas 50, so 50 days had come, they were, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues as a fire, distributing themselves, and they rested on each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. Now there were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were bewildered because they were each one hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and marveled, saying, why are they, why are they not speaking these of the Galileans? And how is it that each hear them in their own language to which they were born? Parthians and Medes and Alamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phygeria, and Egypt, and the districts of Libya around the, the Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and Presolites, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them in our own tongues speaking of the mighty deeds of God. And they all continued in amazement and great perplexity, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others were mocking and saying they are full of sweet wine. But Peter, taking his stand with the eleven, raised his voice and declared to them, Men of Judea and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give heed to my words. For these men are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only the third hour of the day, or 9 a.m. But this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. And it shall be in the last days, God says, that I will pour forth my spirit upon all mankind, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, 
and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my bond slaves, both men and women, I will in those days pour forth my spirit, and they shall prophesy, and I will grant wonders in the sky above, and the signs of the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and glorious day of the Lord shall come, and it shall be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus, the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst, just as, your, just as yourselves know. This man delivered up from the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to the cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. And God raised him up again, putting at the end of agony a death, since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. For David says of him, I was always beholding the Lord in my presence, for he is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Therefore, my heart was glad and my tongue exulted, Moreover, my flesh also will abide in hope, because thou will not abandon my soul to Hades, nor allow thy Holy One to undergo decay. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou will make me full of gladness with thy presence. Brethren, I may confidently say to you regarding the patriarch David that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. And so because he was a prophet and knew that God had sworn to him with an oath to seat one of his descendants upon the throne, he looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of Christ, that he was neither abandoned to Hades nor did his flesh suffer decay. This Jesus God raised up again to which we are all witnesses. Therefore, having been exalted, exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured forth this which you both see and hear. For it was not David who ascended into heaven, but he himself says, The Lord said to my, to my Lord, Sit at my right hand, until I make thine enemies a footstool for thy feet. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent, and let each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children, and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God shall call to himself. And with many other words, he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them, saying, Be saved for this perverse generation. So then those who had received the word were baptized, and they were added that day about 3,000 souls. And they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles, to their teachings, their fellowship, to their breaking of bread, and to prayer. And everyone kept feeling a sense of awe. And many wonders and signs kept taking place through the apostles. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have, as anyone might have needed. And day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals, praying together with gladness and sincerity of heart. Praise God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their numbers day by day those who were being saved. All right. So that was a lot. And we'll try and break that down in a, in a short amount of time here. All right. So obviously a lot of good information in this chapter. And I think this is why uh, we often hear Pastor Mark kind of refer to Acts as, as the foundation of the church. And that's what we'll try and draw out and conclude through today's discussion. So first, let us look at what we're seeing the Holy Spirit doing. The Holy Spirit fills people in verse 4, and he gives people a special understanding or ability to be able to speak in their own language of which they were born. 
The gift from the Holy Spirit allows people to hear what others are saying. Remember, this group of onlookers is about 150 people from all over the world at this point. If you think about it, we've seen this before when we went through Genesis, but in the opposite, where uh, in Genesis 11, 5 through 9, God made it so that nobody could understand each other, and that was so that it would force them to go out and disperse and, and do what he had commanded them to do. And in this case, we're seeing, we're seeing the opposite. He was trying to draw them all together to give them the ability to communicate and function as, a, as one body so that they could understand the word and then be able to go out and, and make disciples of which were they were commanded. In this case, in Acts 2, this is an incredible story. The Holy Spirit comes upon the people in the upper room, most likely where the Last Supper was held. And there was these tongues of fire and things that they were able to start talking. In verses 7 through 9, people from all different parts of the world are coming together to be able to hear these words spoken in their own language. It was interesting when, when I was diving into this and trying to find some more detail on what other scholars felt about the Holy Spirit coming on to the disciples at this point, um, or the apostles. A lot of them think this is the transition from discipleship to becoming apostles, is when the Holy Spirit came upon them at this point. Some folks think it was when Jesus ascended, but there's no clear line in the sand where we see that transition from disciple to apostle. Um, and I was surprised how many scholars and other pastors feel that this is the point to which that occurred if you if you think about it you've had carpenters and tax collectors and you know they were always grumbling amongst each other and and trying to to figure out who was going to lead the group but here you see a pretty clear line in the sand where you know just a basic fisherman uh was able to go out and speak to thousands of people and very well spoken at this point so is it the holy spirit at this point that they went from student to teacher um, and I think that's, you know, just something to think about. Maybe we can draw that out in the discussion groups as well. The gift from the Holy Spirit amazes many and causes us to think that they are drunk. So even 2,000 years ago, we had the, uh, the keyboard heroes and the naysayers and the stone throwers. You know, th this can't be, you know, it's too good to be true. So they're drunk. We'll just throw that label out there and uh, we're, just, we're just not going to believe these, this great thing that we're seeing. So nothing's changed, apparently, in 2,000 years. It's also worth noting that the first church or gathering of Jesus' followers are gathered in a room trying to figure out what they're supposed to do next. And then the Holy Spirit comes upon them and drives them out and takes them into the public scene. So again, like we talked about as we, as we were reading through that we wanted to try and highlight is that we're seeing the Holy Spirit come upon them uniting them, and then driving them out into the world to share the good, the good word of, of what they've been taught up to this point. All right, now let us dive into uh, Peter's sermon in verses 14 through 40. By the way, this is the same Peter that failed Jesus three times. So you look at your failures, you know, nothing like failing Jesus uh, in the presence of him during this time. But you know, those failures didn't, didn't hold him back, and I think that's something for all of us to remember is no matter what your failures are, um, there's always a plan for you and always the ability to, you know, re rebound and, and repent for, for whatever you may have done um, and just move forward, and I think that's what we see here. And now he's, he's so filled with the Holy Spirit that he is the one who gives the, the church's first sermon. Peter says, listen, these people aren't drunk. They're fulfilling the scriptures. Joel said a day like this was coming, a day when God's spirit would be poured out. And Peter says, listen up, hear these words. And then he starts talking about a man, a man named Jesus of Nazareth. He mentions the mighty and great works of Jesus and the power of Jesus. He explains how Jesus did things and works in their midst. This man who lived among them and did the things that people, people witnessed. And these people testified to what they saw Jesus do. Peter then claims that this Jesus of Nazareth did historically verifiable things. Peter says that Jesus, by the plan of God, was crucified. And people actually tells them that you, they, we crucified him, uh, which was probably hard to hear when I could imagine standing up in front of 3,000 people and telling them that it's because of you all uh, and us today that he was crucified. And again, and, and that was in verse 23 where we see him kind of go through and, and 
point the finger back at the crowd that we are all responsible for what has just occurred. So what are we going to do with that and how are we going to move forward? Peter's message then declares that Jesus raised up, raised up and defeated death. It wasn't possible for death to hold him. And then again, he quotes the Old Testament scriptures. Specifically, he talks about King David and how King David says that this great kingdom and that somehow he knew that this day was coming and that a greater king, even than himself, was coming. He spoke about the resurrection even in his day and that Jesus of Nazareth, that God raised up and that he says we are all witnesses to. Let me say that again. Peter is declaring that all of these people are witnesses to the resurrected Jesus. Amen? Jesus, after his resurrection, is, exalt, is exalted to the right hand of God. Again, that is what is going on in Acts chapter 1, which Pat, Pat was able to cover pretty well. That Jesus ascended to be with the Father, and then the Holy Spirit comes down in chapter 2 to the church, and this is what is causing, what is, what is really happening in the story. It's the Spirit filling them all at this point. Peter then calls all of Israel to hear this. He says, everyone hear my message. People are standing by and waiting to know what, what they're supposed to do next. He says, repent, be baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will all receive the Holy Spirit. So not just the apostles, he's saying to all of them, if you, if you do these things and you repent, you can also be saved and receive the Holy Spirit. And I really think this is a great topic for, for us men as a church to go back to over and over again to understand. Peter really hits all the major components of the story and the good news of Jesus. Jesus was a man. He performed signs and wonders. He was crucified. He rose again. He ascended to the Father. And then the Holy Spirit was given. Believe in this. The scriptures themselves foretold of this. Believe, repent, be forgiven, and receive the Holy Spirit. Seems pretty simple. But... You know, it's, it's a shame that not everybody understands how simple it really is to, to be saved. So this is the message that Peter gives. And lastly, what we'll do in the, the last few verses here is we'll cover what the first church did and how they came together. There are some points and components worth definitely noting. These followers were committed to the apostles' teachings. We see in verse 42, it says that they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles. They were committed to the fellowship together they were committed to breaking bed, bread, sharing meals. They were committed to praying together. In verse 43, it says that they all kept feeling a sense of awe and that wonders and signs were occurring through the apostles. This had not happened before because they were not filled with the Holy Spirit at that point. In verse 45, they sold their possessions so that they could take care of one another. They praised God, and every day their numbers increased by those who were saved. So in this chapter, we see some great examples of what the first church did, what they were able to do, how they were able to go out and begin to plant churches that we would know, know of today. We have a clear pr presentation of the good news of Jesus, and we see that the first, what the first church looked like. We should probably often come back to this chapter and reference it if we ever have any questions on on how things were laid out to us, how that roadmap was presented before us. Acts is a crucial book. I think we understand, you know, I've heard Pastor Mark say this before, and I've, I've referenced it um, because I wrote it down. Pastor Matt, Mark has said that Acts is a critical book in bridging the earthly ministry of Jesus to the continued ministry of the Holy Spirit through the apostles and sets the tone for how we should conduct our ministries today. So I think as we go through chapter two and as we lead into the discussions, again, understanding what we found important in this chapter, I think understanding what Peter's message was and why he was declaring the things that he was declaring and trying to remember um, you know, what Jesus had taught them and then how it was to be applied. I think we're seeing the transition from where folks were receiving the word from Jesus and now at this point, they're trying to put it together. And we see this in the first, the first sermon that Peter gives to 3,000 people. So not only was it the first teaching, it was the first megachurch, um, you know, 3,000 people at one time, all being able to understand one language, I think is a, is a fairly uh, verifiable historical event that occurred, um, which obviously is the reason that we're all, 
all here today is because of what that transition, how the Holy Spirit came upon those apostles at that time. Um, you know, it was, I, th I think how Pat was able to break down uh, the essentials of chapter one and how it really all relates throughout the rest of Acts. Once you understand why they were there and what they were tasked with doing and then how they were supposed to carry themselves forward is really the essentials of, of all of Acts. Um, and it's a really a, a good guidebook and blueprint for us, especially as men, to figure out how we're supposed to conduct ourselves, educate ourselves, what we're supposed to do once we have that information and we're armed with it to be able to, to pass that word along. So if we would, we'll, we'll bow our heads and we'll pray and we'll break up into our, our small groups. Dear Lord, thank you again for bringing us together. We thank you for Luke's message and how Peter told this story. We hope you continue to work in us and use this body of men for your betterment. Help us understand your Holy Spirit better. better. Help us be more connected to your Holy Spirit. Lord, we pray you continue to make us better men, young men, sons, leaders, fathers, and husbands. Please continue to watch over us and continue to bless your church, us and our families. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.